Tell us about John Wyndham and the chrysalids and what that means to you. Well, I, I, I suppose really John Wyndham and the chrysalids is always what I consider to be my gateway into science fiction in that when I was fairly young, um, I guess sort of very young teens or maybe even a bit younger, I heard a, a radio adaptation on, I think BBC Radio 4, of the chrysalids dramatised as a, a, as a series. And it completely captivated me. I love the idea of this um boy who thought he who was different and had to hide the fact he was different and everything he went through it, it got me hooked and that was really what then started to be going to libraries and and hunting down first of all John Wyndham books but then that led into Asimov Michael Moorcock and they became very much like and uh, there was a an author called Andre Norton who wrote uh, the Witch World oh, books and various others wonderful yeah who I, I devoured everything that I could find by her. Um, I thought yeah. she was a, a wonderfully evocative author. I mean, what, what I'd think now, goodness only knows, but at that age, she really um, appealed to me and I found something in there I could connect with and relate to. So yeah. yes, but the, the chrysalid is always the, the thing I highlight as that's what brought me in to start with. Um, you are an author yourself, you're, you're successfully published. So um, I'm just going to quickly run through um, The City of a Hundred Rows. Yeah. What was that all about? Um, well, that's an interesting one. I, I, I was actually in the middle of writing an epic fantasy, or trying to, which I've never finished, by the way. And um, on the local um, TV news, they had a programme about Burley House, famous for its horse trials. But this particular thing was looking at the, um, the architecture of the roof of Burley House, which has been designed specifically so that at any point you're standing on the roof there's a, a walkway all around the um inner circumference of, of, of the of the roof and, and at any point you look out and you've got a fantastically aesthetically pleasing um architecture features backed by this wonderful countryside and it was deliberately designed to give you a, a, a great view from wherever you stood and I just looked at it and thought this is brilliant and, and they've got sort of crenulations they've got chimneys with all sorts of decorative bits on all coming up around the city which makes it look superb and I thought what if there was a whole city with this sort of roof there and and this incredible design and from that I went to the computer started writing I wrote about this lad and I, I call it city of 100 rows there aren't 100 but it's a case of you know 89 88 lots people stop yeah. counting it just called 100 there are a lot and the idea that this lad who lives in the gutters, the, the basement level where all the down and outs and the, the, the complete um, dregs of society live, and he, he goes on a dare into aspects or, or levels of the city where he's not allowed to go, witnesses a murder, gets seen by the killer and blamed for the murder. And it's then about him going back to the areas he knows, back into the basement world, and being hunted both by the city's official police and by assassins, sent by the real um, uh, killer. And so that was the premise. And from that, I just went mad. I mean, I, I produced um, renegade um, genetic engineers. I had um, um, complete sort of religion and priests with, with apparently mythical, um, mystical abilities. So I, I really blended um, a bit of steampunk, a bit of... Uh, a bit of science fiction, a bit of fantasy, and just let it all poured into this uh, melting pot of a city and had fun with it. And it was great. <laughs> the, the route I went, I, I got myself established in short stories first. I had about yeah. two dozen published. Yeah. And then by going to conventions, I've met um, editors, agents, publishers. And when I thought, OK, I think I can cope with a novel now, I think I've honed my abilities to the point where I might actually produce something reasonable. I, I then approached the various people I've met at the conventions and said, look, I'm writing something, would you like to see it? And thankfully several of them did. 
and one of them came back to me, which was Angry Robot. And at the time, Angry Robot were a publisher owned by um, Black Library, the people yeah. behind the Warhammer books. Yeah. And they came back and said, really love your writing, but we don't really have room in our um, catalogue at the moment for um, something which is sort of steampunky urban fantasy. Um, it doesn't fit. What we really need is some space opera. Could you write us some space opera books like Alistair Reynolds? Yeah. Now, as you and I know, Alistair Reynolds is literally a rocket scientist at the yeah, time he was working for the European Space Agency in, in Holland. So yeah. when they said, can you write us some space agents, um, opera like a, a Alistair Reynolds? I said, no, I don't have his science. I don't have his experience. But they said, well, pitch us some ideas. And so I did pitch them um, the idea of a, a war that had happened a century or two ago. Um, in the process, one of the sides had invented an AI spaceship. The spaceship had gone rogue and disappeared. And this was now when the war was over and the spaceship suddenly came back to human space. And so it was a case of where's it been, what's it been up to, what's been going on. And, and that formed the, the catalyst for the two noise books. So it was, it was very much space opera, not in the style of Alistair Reynolds, because I ain't Alistair Reynolds. But hopefully with my own interpretation and, and something to say uh, um, through my own voice. Yeah. I took a trope, which is something fairly common in SF, and turned it on its head. The idea that humanity reaches the stars by bootstrapping on alien technology from a long dead alien race. So I took that as the basic premise and switched that around and turned it into something else, which I won't say too much about, just in case somebody decides to read it. I don't want to give too much away. But again, um, I had tried to have fun with it because I, I had... Um, the main character in the first book, who goes on to be the main character throughout, but he more is revealed about him, the main character is a banker. And the idea is that um, a set of fairly disreputable characters with a spaceship think they know where an alien cache of technology is. They want to go and find it and claim it because it's worth lots of money. But in order to um, pursue an expedition like this, they need funds. So they have to turn around to a bank and say, will you fund us to get the equipment, et cetera, we need to do, carry out this expedition. The bank, who generally say no to such things because most of them are a waste of time, thought there's something in this, will say yes. But a condition of their funding the expedition was that the ship accept, accepted one of their agents on board to safeguard the bank's interests. And so he's the main character. He has a hidden past which comes to light and forms the basis then of the rest of the series. Because if the author isn't enjoying writing a book and having fun with it, um, from, from my perspective, that's something that um, hopefully con conveys um, a sense of pleasure and a sense of enjoyment to the reader. And for yeah. me, if I stop having fun with it, I stop writing it well. And so I think uh, it, for me to, um, to express what I'm trying to say properly and effectively to a reader, I've got to be having fun with it. So yes, you're right. I mean, no matter how serious the uh, message, even in short stories, where I can get quite moralistic occasionally with a short story if I'm if I want to make a point, but there's got to be an element of, of fun in there. Otherwise, it comes across as too dry for my taste, and I, I suspect for many readers. It, no matter how um, terrible a situation is, and I, I don't mean this that every every scene of every book has to be comedic, not at all. But I think yeah. there has to be a sense of humour. You have to have a character who's capable of having a laugh, who's capable of relaxing, who is capable of seeing humour in a situation, um, yeah. because that's what we're like in life. Yeah, we can go through all sorts of terrible traumas and, and then still see something that makes us smile or makes us laugh. And I think that writing has to reflect that, because no matter how outlandish the setting or the story you're telling, um, at the, the heart of any good writing, certainly that I, I do, is people and its relationships and how people interact, how they react to a situation. Um, that's what's important. And so I think you've got to make your characters as multi-leveled, as uh, multifaceted and as real to real people as you can, no matter how um, bizarre the circumstances they find themselves in. It's, yeah. it's, the, um, it's the quality of humanity that makes a character convincing and which carries your reader with you. If you take them into unrealistic situations, it's all the more important that the person that they're following, the person they're focusing on, seems real. And humour is a part of that.
I was asked this question interview a while back and um, the answer I gave, the um, simple answer, which I then went on to explain is why is I think down to short term memory loss. Um, to put that into context a little more, I, um, I organised a convention in Northampton back in, oh, I don't know, many moons ago. Um, I co-organised it with, funny enough, I, I got involved in a writer's group um, in Northampton because this is when the internet was in its infancy. Um, I felt I was writing in isolation and needed some feedback from contemporaries. And um, I got in touch with the Northampton Science Fiction Writers Group that at the time was chaired by Ian Watson. Mm. Um, now, yeah. Ian, who I know you know, but yeah. others might not. He's um, a quite brilliant man, genuinely, a, a, a frighteningly intelligent man. He's got um, a, a scholarship from Balliol with honours uh, honors in English and, you know, very, very t talented man. But amongst his many achievements, he wrote the very first Warhammer 40,000 novels, one of which has subsequently been banned because it's apocryphal to their canon. But he also worked for a year with Stanley Kubrick and yeah. wrote the screen story to AI Artificial Intelligence, which Steven Spielberg then made based on Ian's screen story after Kubrick had passed away. So I'd read Ian, I'd read his books, I knew of him. Um, yeah. And as I say, I, I, I got involved in the writing group. They were in the process of organizing a convention, which at the time was 18 months away, I think. But over the next six months, as I began to get involved in the group, the actual organizing of the convention hadn't progressed at all. It was standing very still. And I thought, this is not gonna happen. And, and, and so I, I actually then volunteered to help out and get involved in it, although I had no idea what I was doing. We staged the convention. It went very, very well. We had some fantastic guests, including the artist Fangorn, who at the time he'd just finished working with Spielberg on doing um, uh, designs for War of the Worlds, starring Tom Cruise and things. He'd, he'd done a lot of the um, the, the re screen realizations of the images. So he, he you know, had some great guests. Um, Gwyneth Jones turned up ad hoc. Liz Williams and John Courtney Grimwood were the guests. Fabulous. Um, we knew nothing about organising the convention. We hadn't uh, marketed it. About 30 people turned up and it lost money. So I sat there thinking, well, I've been partially responsible for organising this. A lot of people I know are carrying some debt. I wasn't actually carrying any of the debt, but what can I do to try and help recoup this? I can write, but no one's heard of me. This is before I was you know, published, borrowing a few short stories many years ago. Um, so I approached all the authors who'd taken part in the convention and said, look, this is the situation. We've lost money. Could you donate a story and I'll put a book together? And so the book came out called Time Pieces as a side limited edition. It basically recouped the debt. But I, I knew, didn't know anything about producing a book, about editing, about anything. But you learn on the job. The book came through, the first printed copy, and I held up and thought, suddenly all the traumas, all the mishaps, everything that had gone wrong disappeared from my mind. I just looked and thought, cool, I did this. I yeah. could do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the start of Newcon. It was intended to be a hobby, one book or so a year just to run alongside the writing. Yeah. But gradually it got a momentum and became this behemoth. And we're now 14 years on, we've got over 140 titles out. And I still don't know quite how that happened. <laughs> Initially, it was, to be honest, that I was under the radar because Newcom was new. Um, I was still establishing myself as a writer. So what I was doing, I, I mentioned conventions. I was going to events and I would meet authors who I'd have long admired, people I'd been reading long before I became involved in the community as such. And I'd go up to them and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I've started a small press. And you see, at, at the time, there was nobody producing anthologies in the science fiction fantasy field because yeah. the big publishers found they couldn't make money. Yeah. But I found that by doing it on a smaller scale to my very limited um, operation, I could actually make an anthology work. I could put together a book, pay authors a modest amount, not as much as they'd get for the big boys, but the big boys weren't doing it anyway anymore, um, get the book out there, make a bit of money and everyone was happy. So I'd go up and, and authors I've met and had a drink with in the bar and things, I said, look, I'm doing an anthology next year. Um, I'd love to have a story from you in it. You know, you will get paid, not a fortune. And so I, I was getting people contributing stories. 
Um, that worked fine when I was doing one or two anthologies a year. And as you know, because you came to some of the early um, Newcon conventions that I organised, yeah. say early the last ones. But um, that worked. That was working fine, and um, it was going along okay. And we we managed to get um, the, the great Alan Moore doing an intro for one of the books that we did on stories in Northampton. And as mm. you know, he pitched up for the launch and everything, which was fabulous. Yeah. But gradually, yes. I started then branching out. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why I did, but I did. A, I, I suppose, um, I think I was, I think a, a couple of people came to me and said, look, we've got ideas for this, the, um, doing a, a novel or a, a short novel. And I had a look at them and thought, yeah, this is good. And we'll put it out there. And so I gradually started increasing the volume of books I was doing. Um, I've never, ever had an open submission because I wouldn't have the time to do it. I do read as much as I can which is sadly is not as much as it used to be because of all the commitments that Newcom brings in yeah. but I would sort of you know discover a new author and think this author is really good they're not getting published and so I'd invite them to come and be part of the anthology and I'd have comparatively unknown writers sitting next to very well known writers I mean the, the best best known writers I've probably published are um, Brian Aldiss and, and Neil Gaiman I've been very fortunate to get stories from these people and when you sit those beside a talented but unknown author it, it can't harm that author to get the exposure of being beside a, you know a very well-known author and that, that was the principle I worked on and and gradually it got to the point where in Latte and initially by the way New Compress wasn't making any money it was it was ticking over and maybe covering costs if you were lucky but then it gradually got to the point where it began to make some money it became better known, it, it picked up some awards. And at one point, um, the American editor, Gardner Dozoir, became a great champion of Newcom, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I suddenly, there seemed to be a tipping point um, going back a few years back now, when suddenly I began to get inundated with submissions and I'd get people sending me novels, collections, um, novellas, and that became much tougher because you then really had to start finding time to read more um, submissions and sadly to say no quite a bit of the time, yeah. which is uh, the situation I find myself in now. So it, there's never been a problem getting stuff in. It's only, pro the, the only problem is finding time to actually read and consider everything properly, which anything anyone's written deserves to be considered properly. And so I, I won't just sort of have a look and say, oh, I don't like the look that and send it out. I will read a good portion of anything I'm sent to make sure that that author gets a fair crack at you know at having their work considered properly it's fabulous I, I, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else and that's the great thing about this about the writing and the publishing i'm basically able to make a living in inverted commas um from hobbies which is you know everyone's dream okay maybe football or pop stars everyone's dream but i'll settle for this I've had to be reactive, but again, I, I still feel, I mean, particularly this year, I'm very much out of the publishing loop because normally I'd go to conventions and I'd, I'd have, you know, meals and get togethers with, with um, people at Golantz and people at the other big publishing houses, which, of course, hasn't happened this year. So I do feel I might have floated off on a bubble on my own. But um, certainly when I started out, as I say, there, were, there weren't really that many small presses, PS Publishing, who were big enough not to be a small press but they were there really not that much else in the uk um no one was doing anthologies now there are small presses proliferating which is great and a number of them are doing anthologies which is one reason why i'm doing fewer because i think i sort of had the market almost cornered in the uk for a while whereas mm -hmm. now you know there there are dozens of anthologies coming out every year um so I, i've tended to look for other avenues the digital side of things has been huge. Um, obviously, Kindle and e EPUB have, have come through. When I started out, if they were there, they were in their infancy. And for several years afterwards, I, I didn't even take ebook rights on the original anthologies I did because it wasn't really a factor. Yeah. Yeah. But now, you know, you, you, you can't ignore that as, a, as, a, as a, a, um, a, a source of getting your books out there and getting them before a reader. Um, and of course, audio books have come in now. Um, I've had a couple of dabbles in audio books, not entirely successfully so far, but I, I'm not going to rule that out. That's some, certainly something I'd have a look at again. So you, you've got to be aware of the adapting marketplace. Um, you've got to be um, reactive. Yeah. Proactive would be better, but that's very tough. Reactive, yeah. certainly. Um, and, and that's something that's ongoing. Um, but really, other than that, 
I'm not, it, it's not been a case where I've made any huge sea changes at any point and thought, right, I'm now going to do it differently. I'm going to do this. It's just been an evolving process. And it's very difficult to look back. You said to me earlier, at what point did that happen? Somewhere back in the past. And it yeah. was a gradual process. Yeah. And it, it's, it's not something that I can actually ever say, this happened at this point because I did such and such. The whole thing is one evolving um, process and it never changes. And I never stop learning. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm I, now, I think, a, a pretty decent editor. I probably wasn't when I started out. I was I was learning with the ropes. But all the time you're looking at things, you're thinking, gosh, I didn't realise that. And it, it, it's a process that goes on and on. And and while it does, it keeps me interested. I'd hate to think that I knew everything about something. I'd get bored stiff. 